to to um, uh, to our seminar series and to our institute. Um, uh, she is uh, currently a tenure track assistant professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, she got her PhD in computational biology and applied algorithms and computer science from the Max Planck Institute for Informatics in Saarland um, under the supervision of Professor Tobias Marshall, but founded by Professor Thomas Langauer. Uh, her master's was from computer science from India, from Delhi. Um, and she won many awards. She was a postdoc uh, for a couple of years at Harvard Medical School and Dana Farber Cancer Institute, um, working with uh, George Church. Uh, she was a visiting fellow in Sanger Institute in Cambridge, uh, working with Richard uh, uh, Darbin there. She had industrial experience uh, in Infosys Limited in India. Um, and uh, importantly, she got uh, awards. Um, she had an uh, NIH, uh, National Institute of Health award, uh, K99 award of one and a half million US dollars uh, um, in, in the US. And she was youngest ever re recipient of that award and succeeded in the first attempt also, she currently holds a award from Novo Nordisk as a PI worth 10 million, I believe the Danish crowns or something, I'm not sure, uh, etc. So it is a great pleasure to, to welcome Shilpa. She will tell us today about her advanced computational approaches for understanding allele-specific biology of complex diseases. Thank you, Shilpa. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and inviting me today to present my work. Um, I'm Shilpa Garg. I'm an assistant professor in Department of Biology at the University of Copenhagen. I would talk today about advanced computational approaches that we have developed over the past few years for allele specific biology of complex diseases. <clears throat> So here is the outline of my talk. First, I'll present, I'll start with this fundamental problem of allele specific biology, which is phasing for the human genomes. Then I will present a reference based algorithm to solve the phasing using different data types. And to remove any reference bias, then I will present a new workflow that combines the latest sequencing data types like HiFi and HiC to produce chromosome scale haplotype result genomes. And then in the clinical cases, for example, in the cancer genomes, when there are huge rearrangements, I will present a graph-based approach to handle the complexity of cancer genomes and other um, highly <coughs> diverse genomes to produce, <clears throat> excuse me, phase genomes for those, uh, from those data sets. And I will also present some clinically relevant applications such as into HLA and care regions, and also some more uh, P10 deletions that are have associations with some melanoma cancer cell lines. So let's get started. Um, First of all, what are haplotypes or phasing or allele specific biology? So as we know, humans are diploid, so there exist two copies of each chromosome. Imagine we know the genotypes for these two variants, which is AT, CT, and what we want are the haplotypes, which means A is connected to T and T is connected to C. And the process of obtaining these haplotypes is known as haplotyping or phasing. It has many advantages. It helps to study the human migration, evolutionary structure, and population dynamics. It also is important to understand the cause of the diseases. <clears throat> so advances in sequencing technologies have given us enormous opportunities to produce phasing directly from the reads. For example, starting with these short reads, Illumina next generation sequencing, which when the reads were shorter, about 250 base pairs, and the error rates were very low, to a more recent technologies like PegBio and Nagapore, which are longer reads, so they can span 
many variants into a single read. But here, these third generation sequencing technologies, traditionally like CLR or normal ONT mode, had high error rates like 5 to 10 percent, but the there have been improvements, the error rates have been reducing from <clears throat> these technologies. And the more long range information from SRANSEQ and the high C sequencing technologies. <clears throat> so the next question is, how can we combine these data types into an integrative framework to be applied to multiple genomes at scale? And the process of obtaining the haplotypes directly from the reads is known as read-based phasing. It has many advantages. You can phase rare or de novo variants, et cetera. And more traditionally, approaches like statistical haplotyping and genetic haplotyping has been followed, where in the genetic haplotyping, you, you have the trio information, and you use that trio information to predict the haplotypes based on the genotypes. The limitation of this technique is that you cannot phase uh, the variants that are heterozygous in all the individuals, and also you cannot phase de novo or real variants here. The next one is statistical phasing, where you are given a reference panel and you use the evolutionary model underlying these within this reference panel to predict the haplotypes of the target sample. So imagine on the x axis and this plot on the left are the number of samples, and on the y axis are the phasing error rates. So when you use thousands of samples, the phasing error rates are about 1.5%. But when you increase the sample size to 100,000 samples, the phasing error dramatically reduces to half a percent. So this suggests that you require large sample sizes to produce an accurate phasing, which is limitation in some of the populations. And here, another limitation is you can't phase de novo or rare variants. And then you cannot produce the chromosome scale phasing, and you cannot phase HLA or TIA regions, which are clinically important for diseases. So to overcome this, here we followed a read-based phasing for single individuals, which is defined as follows. You are given a reference genome, and you know the variants and the genotypes. You take the reads from the target sample. It can be from the long reads or it can be from long range information, high C. And then you align these reads to the reference genome. So the alleles in red represents the character that span these variants. So for the diploid genome, the goal here is to partition the reads to two sets. Uh, such that the alleles between any two rows in a partition match. For example, here in the red one, you have AA, GG here, and GG, D. similarly for the blue partition. So when there are no errors in the perfect case, it's this problem is trivial to solve because you can easily identify these partitions and get the haplotypes. But in real case, when you have lot of errors, especially from the long reads, um, this problem is not so trivial to solve. And the goal here is to identify these errors and uh, uh, flip these errors to a uh, other allele in the heterozygous SNPs and get the partitions to get the two haplotypes. So we formulated this problem as a minimum error correction problem, which is to flip the minimum set of entries such that conflict-free bipartitions exist, where conflict-free bipartition holds if alleles between any two rows in the partitions match. So in this example, if we flip this G to T and this T to G, we see that then the alleles between any two rows in partitions match. And we can assemble these partitions to get the two haplotypes. So the first question we asked here is how can we get dense and accurate whole chromosome haplotypes of human genome? To answer that question, um, we made use of two technologies. One is TransSeq and long read data. So the TransSeq is a single cell technology. So the data that you get is very sparse as you observe in this matrix. So you see 
series of zeros and ones and then gaps and zeros and but the beauty is you can get this information on the whole chromosome scale level so there is this whole thing comes from one of the haplotype on a chromosome but to circumvent the issue of sparseness we combine this with the dense local information which you get from the long reads so you get see a series of zeros and ones so this is local and dense so now we get these uh, matrices like this and then we implemented a dynamic programming based algorithm to solve these circumstances in whatsapp it gives you optimal and efficient solution <clears throat> so you can phase human genomes within about an hour so next we were interested to see how the phasing performance is by combining different technologies so first we combine pecbio and 10x data so in this panel uh, you see colors each color represents the phasing segment so more the colors are more fragmented is the phasing and in between this is a centromeric region that we cannot yet phase so and the panels different panels represents the down sampled coverages of pec bio data so here we observe that by using all the pec bio data and all about 60x of 10x we still see a lot of colors here meaning phasing is fragmented and thus it's not on the chromosome scale for the chromosome we would like to see one color throughout the whole whole chromosome but when we combine transic with 10x here we for the first time observe this one color throughout the whole panel suggesting we can now produce whole chromosome phasing um, for human genomes by combining transic and 10x and then we also looked at the accuracy we compare to the uh, state of the art ground truth available from trio uh, data so we observe that um, the phasing error rates like switch error rate and the hamming error rate are less than five one percent um, for these haplotypes so this analysis suggests that we can now produce chromosome scale phasing for human genomes um, that's high quality and also uh, in a scalable manner so the next question the next if we look more closely in this analysis so the first step was to align these reads to the reference genome so this contains a reference bias imagine you have a diverse genome for example from african ancestry and you would like to face uh, uh, these diverse genomes in that case this uh, had some limitations so to overcome that here, next question I asked was, how can we do chromosome scale haplotype result assembly of human genomes? So here we made use of PacBio HiFi and HiC data. HiFi at this stage, the numbers have improved. So the average read lengths are about 20 kilobases and the error rates are less than 1%. And in the cases when Stranseq is not available because it's not commercialized yet, and also it's a bit tedious to produce in a lab. So we make use of high C information, which is broadly used uh, and also contains the spatial information. So the next question I asked was, how can we combine high fi and high C to get the haplotypes, two haplotypes for human genome? So a little bit background on HiFi sequencing technology. So you start with high quality double-stranded DNA, and then you ligate the adapters and perform the annealing, which led the polymerase to bind. And then essentially you perform repeated passes of sequencing on this circularized DNA. And then on these subreads, you call the consensus that produces high highly accurate long reads so the accuracy is about 99 percent and the read lengths are about 20 kilo base pairs and in the high c technology essentially it captures 
the spatially close segments and then you ligate the adapters and then perform the sequencing using the standard Illumina sequencing. So in this plot on the x-axis, you see the genomic loci and on the y-axis is the contact frequencies. So higher, darker the color is, higher is the contact frequency. So here, if you observe closely in about 10 megabases, these contact frequencies are quite high. While you go up, uh, it go, drops down. The signal is not there. So this suggests high c is a technology that can give you long range information up to 10 megabases. And then a little bit background, how of combining these data types like and the over the literature, as we know. So genome assembly has started with the human genome project two and a half decades ago. At that time, the reads were short and we cannot span these short reads through these re repetitive regions here. So the graphs that we constructed, they were more messy and I won't go in details of the graph. Essentially, there were approaches like over, overlap graph and debridging graph that were used to, to produce. But the graphs from the short reads looks like this. But when we moved from short reads to longer reads, the because now you can uniquely assign the reads to the repetitive region where they can span them. So the graphs look, look better and and we can get more continuous assemblies compared to the short reads. But in these approaches, the major limitation was the two haplotypes were collapsed to a single consensus sequence. Even today, our human genome is a haploid sequence. It is finally finished, but it's still a haploid sequence. So there have been works to produce uh, two haplotypes, for example, Falcon Unzip and Trio Kanu and Trio Hyphasm. So these approaches have, some of them have a limitation that they cannot produce a fully phased on the chromosome level. And this in this, it made use of the trio information, which not readily available, especially in the clinical setting. So to overcome these limitations here, I proposed a new workflow, which is to combine HiFi and HiC data. So we essentially start with HiFi and produce unfazed contiguous assemblies uh, from that. And then we scaffold these uh, continuous sequences using HiC to produce the scaffolds. And these scaffolds are now at the chromosome level. Further, we remap these uh, HiFi reads to these scaffolds and calls these heterozygous SNPs. And these SNPs are informative to find the phasing of each read and make the two partitions. And then we assemble these two partitions separately to get the phased contigs. And we were interested to receive the runtime of this workflow. And we can, for the first time, can do this within a day. These are because of the advancements in the technology as well as these computational frameworks. And then we evaluated uh, this workflow on the public available genomes like H002 for which there is already a good ground truth available. And we use the standard evaluation matrix for, um, for com comparison. So here you see we produce about three gigabases of each haplotype, which is as expected. Um, and we have we were not able to yet do the sex chromosomes properly. So that's why this uh, uh, it's not 3.1 yet. And we can produce better continuous assemblies as the N50s are about 25 megabases in comparison to traditional approaches. And we can face larger fraction about eight times better than the trio Kanu approaches. And we observe this trend for other genomes as well. And this suggests we are now in an era to produce chromosome scale phased assemblies um, in less than a day. Next, um, 
for the more complex genomes, such as cancer, where there are aneuploidy issues and many structural rearrangements, this workflow has some limitations because it has this, um, this step of unfazed scaffolding. So to, to overcome that issue here, the next question we ask, how can we enable routine production of haplotype resolved assemblies for healthy as well as cancer genomes? So to answer that question, we made use of the HIFI reads, but in the um, but the major basic idea is while we find the overlaps between these HIFI reads, we also use the phasing information in the in the overlapping step. So we find these heterozygous SNPs. And then over these SNPs, if the reads have the same alleles, for example, gray and gray hair, that means they belong to the same haplotype. If they are from yellow, that means they are from the different haplotype. And we incorporate this information in a graph, which is a compact representation to, for, for multiple data types. But first we uh, make this graph from the HIFI, where each node is a read, and the connections are the haplotype specific overlaps. And then you see these beautiful structures, which are the bubbles in the graph, which actually represent the real uh, genomic characteristics. That means either SVs or any complex rearrangements in this graph form. <clears throat> and then, so based on this STIP algorithm, we produced a phased unitic graph from using hyphasm from uh, the from the HIFI data first. So you get these HIFI unity graph. And then for finding the phased context and the phased scaffolds, we bring in this long range information from the high C technology on this graph space. So what we do, we find the distinct gamers between the alleles in these bubbles. And these have been known as heterozygous gamers. And we use these hat gamers as anchors to map the high series onto the graph space in a haplotype of manner. And we perform this operation in a, in a gamer setting. And that we can do in very fast in about two hours for on the whole human genome, which traditionally the full alignment used to take about eight hours. Uh, for this operation. So once now we have the high C reads mapped onto the node sequences in the graph, we make use of the maximum support of the high C reads to first find out the haplotypes from each component and we save them as phased contexts. And the next step is to connect these phased contexts in the right orientation and the ordering to perform the phased scaffolding operation. And to do that, we make use of this neighborhood property, which captures the instinct, instinct properties of the high C data that for a given edge, if there is a high, high C support, if its neighboring edges are equally supported, then this is a good edge. Otherwise, this is not a good edge. So we make use of this proper neighborhood property to further find out the ordering between the, and, and the details are still in the, the, this work is under revision and the details are hopefully will be out soon if you are interested or reach out to me if you are interested to know more, more about the details of the phase scaffolding step. So now this is how we can produce the scaffolds. And then we uh, evaluated this PS tools method first on the healthy public healthy genomes and also then on the cancer genome. So as we see, PS tool produces complete genomes about 6.1 for humans as expected, but it can produce now the phase scaffolds on the chromosome level, which is about 132 megabases then the traditional trio approach is about 78 megabases. And also the phasing error rates are comparable and the time is about less than half a day for performing the whole operation. And similar results we observed 
on other healthy genomes. And on the colo 829 which is a melanoma cancer cell line, we say that the here also we can produce scaffolds, phase scaffolds on the chromosome level with about 132 megabases. And, uh, and the time is similar about less than half a day. So this suggests we can now perform chromosome scale haplotype resolved assembly for complex genomes also. For example, colo 829 we sequenced the two coverages of about 40, 40x for each uh, high phi and high C. And then we using these phase genomes, we call the structure variations from them. And in about, we found about 26, thousand somatic and germline variations out of which there were about 13,000 insertions and 9,000 deletions, 29 duplications, and there were few tens inversions. And more than 30% of them were missed using short read based and traditional short read based analysis. And next we looked at few complex genes that if this method can also reliably detect those structure variations in those genes. For example, here we found this 12 KB deletion, which affects this P10 gene on chromosome 10, and we could reliably find that deletion as well. So next we looked at some of the clinically relevant regions, for example, HLA, which has known phenotype of um, schizophrenia, psychiatric, and autoimmune diseases. So we took our assemblies and we aligned them to the reference genome. So darker the region is, higher is the divergence of the assemblies to the reference genome. So you observe here that in HLA-AA and DQB and DQA, there is high divergence in these assemblies compared to the reference, which were, which are traditionally missed using short read based techniques because DQB and DQA have some repetitive regions and also C4A uh, that were not properly reconstructed using short read based techniques only. And similar um, uh, data was observed even in the Kier region. For example, in DL3 and DL4, there is higher divergence of this region, and we can now find the, the, any variation in such regions using these de novo approaches, long read and based de novo approaches. Then we looked at one more gene, which is PRDM9. So it has a few bases repeating thousand times in this gene finger array. So it happens in both humans and mouse. So in this plot on the bottom, you see short read alignments to the reference. On the top, you see our assembly aligned to the reference. So when you, you see here, the alignments looks confused because these are the repetitive regions and the short reads have limitation. Whereas the alignments looks clear because they are more long read based alignments and the computational methods can reliably uh, make use of these data types to for assembly reconstruction. And then we were also interested if we can use some of these methods for GWAS. So we just performed an initial analysis of uh, uh, narcolepsy, which is, for example, we took one case control study where PGP1 is a case, has a phenotype of narcolepsy and it's 002 in a control. And then there is a, need lab panel available for the narcolepsy. And we calculated the statistical significance for each of them to the, and we found that on chromosome 19, there are 25 out of 42 variants in PGP1 that were highly statistical significant to narcolepsy need panel, whereas uh, this is a control. So we don't see any high statistical significance. So this, uh, suggest that we can, these assembly-based approaches, they're also important for the GWAS analysis and clinical diseases. So yeah, so to, in a nutshell, I would like to conclude my talk here, where first I 
presented a reference-based approach to combine local information from long reads and the long range information from strand seek to produce the chromosome level phasing, which is in the space of a reference genome. And we can produce high quality phasing at scale. Next to remove any bias from the reference genome, we, uh, I presented a new workflow to perform the chromosome scale haplotype resolved assembly using HiFi and HiC data. Then I have generalized this approach to a more graph based approach that can incorporate the complexities from the HiFi and HiC and also these genomic characteristics from the cancer genomes and presented some applications of these approaches to medical and population genomics. So in a nutshell, I'm excited to develop new algorithms and data-driven approaches that can utilize these diverse form of data sets, which are massive and error-prone, but I'm excited to develop these computational approaches to yield meaningful insights to enable precision medicine and understanding of complex diseases using haplotype aware methods. And um, our group is looking for interns, PhDs, and uh, postdocs, in case you are interested, please reach out. And I would like to thank my collaborators, my mentors, and funding agencies for this work. And also, as the seminar is a women in bioinformatics, I would like to share my experience as a woman um, in this exciting field of uh, bioinformatics. So, um, I believe mentors have a big role in my career who can recognize your skill set and believe and support you and, and enable creativity to advance the career at different stages. And, and I think this field is still a bit like assembly area. Um, is still like less women. I hope to see more women, women in this area. Um, and yeah, I'm always uh, happy to share my own experiences or provide any support and help for young generation if you are excited about such a research area um, and provide any sort of support from my end. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shilpa. Um, we have uh, time for some questions. So yeah, you can raise your hand or you can just, just jump in and ask, it's okay. Or you can write in chat, whatever you prefer. Hi, okay. this is David, I'll just jump in. <laughs> Good. Hi, thank you for the talk. Very, very interesting, very interesting. We have time later, but and, and I will not make it very extensive, but I, I wonder what is your, your opinion on um, the, so how, how do you think it's going to be incorporated uh, long sequencing into GWAS analysis, mostly for imputation and to in the generation of, of reference panels, given that for SNVs and indels, sure, reads are okay, uh, but they're not good for structural, but on the long reads, it's the other way around. And uh, people, some people start saying, no, no, forget about short reads, you, you, no, no. But still the long read is not ready to absorb all what the short reads is giving. What is, what is your opinion here, please? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, uh, so short reads are going there, like right now with these hi-fi, data specifically, we have started to observe the sensitivity and the specificity for SNP calling of like more than 99%. Mm -hmm. Like at this is the observation on like, yeah, on the healthy genomes, like, like yeah, I understand more like extensive analysis is still to be done on the clinical samples. For example, this may not directly translate to something like schizophrenia, where this complexity is even higher. So I, but 
I hope the technologies are improving so the error rates would go down like in a few years. So I am I am a believer of that uh, yeah short long reads may replace short reads. Uh, in future, as well. But we will see, like, of course, they have other limitations, like they're still expensive, cannot scale up as much as like short to like 100,000 samples, like still we are uh, in the long read era, we are still doing like maybe thousands of samples at this stage, we need a lot of funding opportunities to enable like million samples, whereas in the short reads, we are already there. Or alternatively, maybe there is a new technology that comes up uh, like that can actually not expensive, like that can scale well. Uh, so that is an interesting area to see. But at this stage for the normal sample, for the normal like HZ022, we have observed that the SNP calling like has like is, uh, is pretty good, like more than 99%, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Good to see you again. Yes, the same. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. More questions? Anybody else? Well, while you guys while you guys think, maybe I can ask some computer science question. So what you have shown is uh, these graphs that uh, you work with. Uh, they, are, they belong to the interval graph family. You probably know that, that there were some algorithms using that, but an interesting thing is that interval graphs are both chordal and perfect, yep. which means that they have linear time recognition, that uh, optimal coloring, maximum clique, they can all be done in yep. linear time. Yep. So have you, have you thought uh, along these lines how to exploit these properties uh, you know, because you can easily get yeah, these yeah. algorithms, maybe not in linear, but maybe a little bit more than linear time, yeah. where when you detect these anomalies, these are only yeah, the yeah. places where, where you detect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So we haven't done that yet. Like, for example, even phasing, like it's essentially a maximum click, like finding things SVs is a maximum click problem. Yeah, we haven't like yet started like the algorithmic, aspect of it's like in the assembly like in area it's like two area one is this implementation where you can use a lot of greedy heuristics to make it efficient and but and then another is this putting like asymptotic bounds or studying so we haven't done that yet but that's an interesting area i would be very interested to collaborate and uh, explore uh, like, I mean, it's not the question. It's not about theory. I mean, theory is there. It's shown. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, it's applying on that. Yeah, very, yeah. Very, very, I think, very effective and and fast. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Thanks. Yeah. That's yeah. a great point. Yeah. Uh, more questions. All questions are welcome, even about this uh, women in uh, bioinformatics path, etc. Your path was probably uh, maybe more challenging than others coming from India, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. So Miguel, Miguel, you have a question? Uh, yeah, um, you mentioned HLA genes before. I was wondering if you were using the latest build that has this alternative context and what would be the issues using that? Uh, do you mean the alternate contexts that are in the reference genome? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we actually looked at the them, and I think they had some limitations. Like mm -hmm. they were not complete. They cannot get the full fitting, and also especially, and also there were errors. And okay. uh, that's understandable because it's those alternate like GRCH thirty eight like. Um, of course has gone through many revisions, but still it was based on very much this erroneous long read data. Uh. Yeah, so it was basically this spec bio CLR and other yeah, biological explain like were done, but it wasn't there yet, but this hi-fi and these new methods have, I think made a good advancement in that region. 
So, and I saw on, a, on one of the slides mentioned the previous build. So, what your work generally uses the the latest build or the one before uh, HC thirty eight or the HC nineteen? Uh, it's thirty eight. Thirty eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think most of that is done on 38, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your question, by the way. I have more questions if no one, well, we have, don't have any other takers. Yeah, yeah, we were discussing, there's a, a working group that I'm on for variant column. We were discussing about these reference issues and you mentioned that uh, when you, for instance, you're looking at uh, an African sample and the reference is not very re uh, reflective of that population. So we're having this conversation and I was trying to find what is it exactly that happens when you, when you encounter this problem? Because if you, uh, so I, I guess the, the, the worst thing that can happen is that your reads are placed yeah. in the wrong place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mapping is one issue. Yeah, exactly. But if the mapping is correct, it doesn't matter that you have you have some reads that are stuck. Because these are these regions are highly divergent, so the reads will not be mapped. Some of them will not be even mapped. Okay, so it's a problem of mapping because if they are mapped correctly, it doesn't matter that you have more or less SNPs because they're they're gonna be across all the reads anyway. Yeah. So you're still going to be able to phase them. It's just the mapping that they're that and they land on the wrong place. Repetitive regions, right? Because um, because some repeats they have high identity. For example, the segmental duplications. Mm -hmm. um, so so in that case, we need to distinguish these repeat units and also distinguish the haplotypes. I think. If you do only mm, reference right. based, even that breaks. Whereas you, if you do de novo, like don't like in that case, in the reference thing, it's a more like a polyploid phasing problem. But I think it's right. still uh, hard. But in the de novo, it turned out to be better than like taking these regions and working. And and yeah, so following up on that, if you what what was the difference downstream of doing uh, of aligning to a reference of doing the noble when you go down to the application, where do you see a difference in calling SBs, in calling SMBs, in where is it where you find the improvement? Yeah, so especially one is this complex regions in the de novo are better like these, all these repetitive regions where mm -hmm. there that, and also in as we callings like Denovo approaches were better than. And have you heard about this telomere to telomere yes. reference? Uh, yeah. Yeah. How does that affect you? Uh, so yeah, that's, a, that's a, so I haven't yet like applied this whole analysis to telomere to telomere. Um, because this can hold translate to that reference genome. Uh, and there are also centromeres resolved in that. Mm -hmm. So I don't have comprehensive okay. uh, uh, like analysis on that. Mm -hmm. But like in case the reads, they're line well in the centromeres, I think then we can. So, yeah. so it, it will help with the problem of mapping, which you already improved while doing the uh, reference free the novel yeah. thing right yeah. so yeah. it doesn't doesn't really improve much over the the novel version of things i guess yeah 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 okay so we have some conversation slotted later so i tell the small things i'll i think i'll bring up on sure. that. if you have okay. any questions feel free to reach out i would be glad to contribute Thanks. Thanks. It was a great talk. Thank you. Yeah, very much. that was a very interesting discussion as well. Thanks. Okay. Are there any other questions? No? Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Shilpa. This was very nice. Um, and I look forward to talking to you. If you want, we could uh, start, maybe take five minute break and then start. We yeah. don't have to wait till one or something. Is that yeah, good? Sure. Yeah, oh. that sounds good. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you. And thank you all. Bye-bye.
Thank you all. Bye bye. Last talk. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.